What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD interview. Every single week, we bring you interviews with top entrepreneurs and just straight up top badasses. They're out there doing big things with their lives and their businesses and, and uh, just kicking ass, right? Um, so before we jump into this interview, as always, I want to plug our sponsors that make all this possible. So our first sponsor is PerfectStormNow.com, www.PerfectStormNow.com. It's effective, affordable, front-end lead generation software. That's a lead generation machine. You know, I'm 100% adamant on teaching real estate agents how to fish for themselves. I don't want to be reliant on realtor.com, truly a Zillow. Um, I don't have to stroke checks and be relying on others to feed me. I want to learn how to go out there and feed myself, fish for myself. So if you're looking for a platform where you can go out there and become your own uh, Zillow, right, where you're able to go out there and, and fish for yourself, generate massive free leads, very high quality, low cost, uh, uh, paid traffic, go check us out, www.perfectstormnow.com. Uh, also, show is brought to you by our 90 Day Mastery Bootcamp, www.90daymastery.com. It's a, a mentorship with me, you guys. It's a 90 day hardcore mentorship with me personally. We go deep. It's three hours every single week, two hours of live coaching, one hour of QA every single week. You have daily access to me in the mastermind. Uh, you get access to every aspect of my business from presentations, tracking forms, scripts. There's nothing that you don't get. I mean, we, we spend this 90 days making sure that you master this. this business, mastering what it takes to make money in this business, right? We build out your playbook. We ensure and make sure that you go out there and have all the skills and all the knowledge to go out there and kick ass and create what you want to create in this industry. Um, so for a very full, small investment, dude, you can go out there and, and make millions through a program like this, right? So that's uh, www.90daymastery.com. Use the promo code Live Mastery, L-I-V-E-M-A-S-T-E-R-Y, all caps, all together, all one word. Next one is starting a April 6th. Um, we only <coughs> do these every couple months, right? So um, make sure you guys jump in right away. You know, why wait on uh, uh, going out there and exploding your business? Um, also, real quick, I ask that you guys share the show. You know, I want to continue bringing these, uh, uh, bringing epic content for you guys for free, um, always, right? So the only way that we can continue doing that is the growth of the show. So I need your help. I need you to share this show. Share with anybody that you think can benefit from it. Um, <clears throat> leave positive reviews, dude. If you're listening on iTunes or Stitcher, leave a, a positive review. You guys share the show, um, and uh, we appreciate you watching. So that being said, you guys really stoked to jump into today's interview. Today's interview was with uh, Nathan. Dart. He's a real estate agent, real estate team leader, real estate broker owner out of Maryland. Um, this guy's an amazing entrepreneur. This guy has is, is, uh, got some serious passion. Um, this guy, it, it takes a lot to fire me up, dude. And, and this dude fired me the hell up last night, man. I was getting uh, just goosebumps listening to this cat. So hopefully you guys enjoy this interview as much as I did. And uh, we'll see you soon. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD interview. Well, every single week we interview top entrepreneurs and just straight up top badasses that are out there dominating their space, that are choosing to go out there and create epic lives, choosing not to live a life of mediocrity. So today, you guys, we got a rock star on the call. Um, this has been a guy that uh, I've been connected with for some time. He's out there growing his business at massive levels. So really stoked and honored to have Nathan Dart on the show. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, absolutely, dude. So, you know, we were talking a lot before we hit the record button, and you've yeah. got this, this massively growing team, very uber successful real estate team, one of the top in the country. But before we get into what you're doing today, dude, let's rewind the clocks. You know, go yeah. back to, I don't know, high school, college. Like, how, how did this entrepreneurship journey begin? <laughs> well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, for me, I grew up in it. I'm second generation in this business. My father... He, he started he started it. He started in 1985. He had a full-time gig. He was working for Bechtel. He was uh, basically a subcontractor on a nuclear power plant. We were traveling all over, you know, through Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Texas, and ultimately ended up in Maryland. He said, uh, you know, I'm tired of this. And we were constantly moving about every six months. And I was in kindergarten during that time. He decided to quit his job. He had three kids and got started selling real estate. So how he got started was he went into his office manager and says, okay, what do I need to do to get started? Well, that office manager said, Craig, what you need to do is you need to go knock on the doors. So he took myself, my two younger brothers, and we went out knocking on doors. I said, there's nothing more sympathetic than having a father with his three sons knocking on doors. I mean, that, was, that, that, that did it. And during that time, he was rookie of the year, his first year in real estate. From then on, he went to being one of the top agents in the state of Maryland. And he had that all through the 90s. But when he did it, he also had owned and operated one of the first REMAX offices in the state of Maryland during that time. 
So during that time, it was straight hustle for my father. He was doing 80, 90 transactions a year. He was working 14 hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, we get this. I mean, we're, we're talking to entrepreneurs. We're talking to real estate professionals as it is. So you guys get it. And during that time, I grew up in that real estate office. I was the oldest of the three boys. My mom was doing the bookkeeping. My dad, when he was doing 80, 90 transactions a year, he did it by himself. He didn't have admin staff. He didn't have buyer's agents, didn't have other listing agents helping him out. It was all by himself. And during that time, he would burn himself out. It was tough watching the transitions that my dad went through, the ups and downs. I mean, it'd be like he'd go on seven-year runs and then he'd crash. The first crash would take him out about a month, right? And he'd gear up for the second round. And he'd go for another seven, you know, seven years. Then he'd crash again. It'd be like three months that he'd take off. He went for another run again, and that crash you know, took him out for about six to eight months. And I saw this progression through my father's life, but I admire my father. He's my role model. I look up to him. I, I admire the grit and the hard work that he put into obviously building what he built. But during that, I was, you know, of course, growing up in that house, you know, I knew that all they were wanted, ever wanted to do was sell real estate. So I'd go to all the REMAX conferences since I was 12 years old, you know, going to whether it be Vegas or Orlando or whatever is appropriate to take me to at the time. And I would love going to hear my dad at, at different seminars and it kind of put together business plans with him. And I just loved being around my father and learning what he was doing, the struggles that he went through, but also being able to put things up together to allow it to grow. So I got licensed back. Uh, I was taking my real estate classes back when I was 17, before my senior year in high school. I figured uh, I had it all big planned out, planned out that I was going to uh, graduate high school, go to community college, live with my ex-girlfriend, which I'm glad that didn't work out, <laughs> go, go live with her and sell real estate. I presented this to my dad because my dad comes to me and says, Nathan, what's your plan? I said, Dad, I got it all figured out. I tell him the plan. He says, absolutely not. One, you're not selling real estate to graduate college. Two, you're not going to community college. And three, you're not living with her. So I said, <laughs> okay, fair enough. So I went off. I was at Penn State because that's the only school that offered a real estate degree. Transferred from there. Uh, had a good time there. But transferred. Went to Maryland. Graduated from Maryland. Sold four houses my senior year in high in, senior year in college. And my dad's like, dude, just graduated already. I did. I got it. Started out the gate, and I, I knew it's what I wanted to do. My dad, um, you know, as a team leader, as a role model, as a father, I, I, I appreciate what he did for me. But he made me learn it. He, he he forced me to figure this thing out. He wasn't the type of guy who's going to hold my hand. Um, he, he made me earn it. I remember uh, now I ran, I had my own businesses that I was running in, in college. I had a debt cleaning company that I was running. I had a, you know, I was doing home improvement stuff on a lot of his listings. So I was doing a lot of work in college as it was. So fortunately, I did have money because the first thing he asked me to do is, Nathan, you need to stroke me a check for $1,000. I said, Dad, for what? He goes, well, what you're going to do is you're going to advertise all my listings on this real estate magazine. Because I graduated college in 2002. That's well before we could advertise Zillow and Trulia and everything else that's out there. So, but we still had to spend $1,000 to advertise on the premier page on a real estate magazine. That's where I got all my leads. And then from that, I, was, I closed 35 deals my first year in real estate. It was just straight hustle. I was burning through girlfriends left and right. I couldn't, keep, <laughs> couldn't lock any of that down. And, uh, but I was working. I loved what it was I did. And my mindset was knowing what my father did being a rookie of the year and what he did. I said, okay, that's, that's what I want to do. And, and I did that. And I, I loved it. I loved working side by side with my dad. I loved being able to see and grow something for our family, continue to build that legacy that my dad worked so hard to build um, and really kind of make it my own. And as I continued to progress, I was doing, you know, my first year I did 35 transactions. My first year moved on, started to, you know, plateau at like 45 transactions, 55 transactions is kind of where I maxed out as working buyers because that was just all hustle. I was doing all by myself. And fortunately, in around 2006, I, I met my wife and uh, she kind of got things uh, in order for me, right? It, it says we all need. And, uh, you know, when we got married, we said, you know, I want to do things a little bit differently. I don't want to make the same sacrifices that my father did. Now, I'm so grateful for the sacrifices that he made, but I said, let's just do it a little different. We don't have to do that all the time. So I got involved in coaching. I, I've been uh, a member of Richard Robbins International Coaching Program since 2006. I love it. I, I give so much credit to his organization, what's he been able to provide to me and my family. Uh, but I got started with him, and that's really kind of when I started to build the concept of a team. And I'm really trying to find a way to leverage myself. And through that growth, trust me, I learned a lot of very expensive mistakes. I'm almost glad that they were so expensive because it really made me feel them, right? If, <laughs> if they weren't as expensive as they were, I don't know if I would have learned from them. And, you know, I hired the inexpensive assistants that I was paying $12 an hour for that never worked, right? That, you know, I went through three or four of those. I took on a buyer's agent, gave her, you know, a ton of leads and, and nothing closed out of that. And it was probably the worst time that could have happened because it was around 2007, 2008, which for all of us in the States, we can all appreciate what happened in 07, 08. Uh, that learned, I learned that mistake because that cost me about $180,000, that little mistake there. Um, what it came down to is that I was not prepared to be a team leader at that time. 
I didn't have the right uh, tools and, and uh, you know, the ability to be able to take on that leadership role. And um, so I wasn't ready for that yet. And then, you know, had some good years, uh, certainly through that growth and through coaching. And then uh, 2007 hit. That was always a fun time. 2007, it was August of 2007. Um, 2007, at that time, I did, at the time, it was the best year I'd ever had in real estate. I was number eight individual in the state of Maryland at the time. I was, uh, as far as I was concerned, I was crushing it. I was like, I'm a badass, number eight. I mean, individual. I was 26, 27 years old at the time. And um, I thought, you know, hey, at this point, I don't need to continue to go out and, 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 and you know, get new leads and, and knock on doors and send out the direct mail and do everything that I know it takes to get done to convert those leads. I, I got complacent. I, I, I felt that at this point, I'm number eight. You know, I'm doing like, I don't know, it's 400 plus in commissions earned at that time. And I think, I'm a, I'm a badass. This is, this is, I just earn the business. People just come to me now. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case because in 2007, I found uh, it hit me in the face really hard at that time. And, um, my wife and I bought our first house in August of 2007, put 20% down the house and uh, did all the renovations that my wife uh, had asked because, of course, that's what we're supposed to do, right? And I, what I didn't realize at the time is that I was going to have one more settlement and that was going to be in October. I had that settlement in October and I didn't know that I wasn't going to have another settlement until April of the following year. Well, that hurt. It, it, it hurt bad. And uh, I didn't really know how to deal with that yet because uh, I was still riding high on this you know, being a badass number eight in the state. And uh, so I just continued doing what I was doing, which was being complacent. And I was in my own way. And around December, it started to catch my attention because I'm like, this is becoming a problem now. And I had to dig deep. I, I was in a tough place. I was, no question, I was depressed during that time. I found myself uh, waking up in my new house at like five, six o'clock in the morning because I couldn't sleep because I was stressed out trying to figure out where this next transaction was going to come from. I went back to all the coaching that I ever was involved with, whether it be with Richard Robbins or Howard Britton or whatever it was that I had done in the past. And digging deep, I was focusing on my future focus. I was focusing on my goals. I was focusing on you know, vision boards. What could I do to, to get myself back in the right mindset? And it was tough because I didn't know that I was going to ever find a way out of it. And really, so the turning point in my career was when my father came to me and he says, he says, Nathan, you know, we got the REMAX conference coming up because that's just what we do in our family. I've been to, I don't know how many, 25 plus conferences over, over my lifetime. And, um, you know, the Vegas conference is coming up and we're staying at the MGM Grand. And my dad's like, well, I got the room. You know, where's your, did you get your room? Where are you booking your flight out? And this, that, and the other. I said, well, dad, that's, uh, I'm glad you're talking to me about that because there's something I need to tell you. He says, yeah, what's going on? I said, well, dad, um, you know, we bought the house, right? He said, yeah, of course. And, uh, and you know, I had a settlement in October, but I haven't had one since. And now at this point, it's January. He says, okay. He goes, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, that's what I need to talk to you about, Dad. I said, uh, well, I need a loan because at this point, i got a mortgage that i got to pay for. I got, uh, you know, I've exhausted everything I possibly could as far as sending out direct mail pieces or what have you. And uh, I'm in a tough place. I said, can you help me out? He says, well, Nathan, here's the deal. And of course, my dad during that time was just like a lot of the dads that were out there, uh, focused on what Fox News had to say and Glenn Beck and everybody else. And the world was coming to end and you got to stockpile, uh, you know, food in your basement and everything else. And uh, his advice to me was, Nathan, I'm not going to give you money. Uh, you need to quit selling real estate. You need to foreclose on your house. You need to find a full-time job. Now, coming from my mentor, my role model, my father, and in a point of uh, desperation and depression that I was taking on, because I also have a new wife at this time, we've only been married a year, buying our new house, and it crushed me. It crushed me. My parents left, and uh, my wife turns to me and crying. She says, Nathan, uh, so what are we going to do? I said, honey. I said, well, I'm not quitting real estate. I said, we're going to take a line of credit on one of our investment properties, and we're going to figure this thing out. And if we don't have a settlement in the next three to four months, that's all we have left. Um, then we will have to figure something out. But for now, we're going to do everything we can. And we did. We took a loan on the house. Um, and uh, you put, it put that into direct mail. We're doing direct mail. I was calling past clients. We had nothing else to be doing at the time. And I uh, went out and got a CDPE designation, uh, which I was grateful for that. And um, came back and I said, well, this is obviously where the market's going, but i got to build a team around it. And this time I didn't have a team. So at that time, I said, I have to find a way to build a team. And I did. That's really the start of my team. So I started that team in 2008. And uh, now that started from one person. Now we've continued to grow 27% since 2008, which I was grateful for. Uh, we, at 2008, we had a huge turnaround. A lot of it came down to just mindset 
and uh, to turn around so much so that I actually had a better year in 2008 than I did in 2007 uh, after all that we had went through. But I needed that, Josh. I mean, it's, 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 it's a tough thing. Complacency is, uh, can be brutal for the people that uh, don't accept it. And, um, but at that point, that was a transition. We started growing the team. So we started uh, with, with one operations manager, grew from there. Now, at this point, we've got 12 people on the team. And like I said, grew at 27% a year uh, from there. So things have been good. But right now, it's, it, it's a team. Uh, I, uh, I bought a Remax franchise, actually my father's franchise. I bought that from him in 2009. And uh, at this point, I'm a, a broker owner here in Rockville, Maryland, as well as a, a team leader. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to be a leader, obviously, for that of not only my brokerage, but most importantly, the, the team as well, because that's, that's so critical. Yep. So that's uh, kind of... Yeah, no, I love it, dude. And, 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 you know, the reality is I've yet to meet any uber successful person, you know, that hasn't had some lows. Like, like you said, man, we got to have that pain delivered in our life to, to wake us up, Right. So the question really is, okay, 2008, I mean, going into 2008, nothing's going on. You're struggling. You're like, I got to build this team, but you don't have any money. You have no yeah. closings. Like, how do you build a team, dude? Like, how did you restructure it? And how did you get people to buy into you, you know, when, when you really didn't have much going on at that time? Yeah, no, great question, Josh. Yeah, that was the tough part, right? I had no money. <laughs> I mean, I, I, was, I was taking the loan to get me out to take that uh, CDP class. Um, so when I came back, I said, yeah, it's all built on systems. I got to build out the systems and I'm not, I'm not the type of personality that's going to build out the system. I'm a visionary. I can, I can, I get the idea of the, what the systems are going to be, but somebody else is going to have to put that together. At the time I didn't have a CRM, I didn't have anything. So I ended up hiring a guy that actually worked in my father's old office and, uh, he was struggling. It was 2007. Everybody was struggling, right? I mean, like more than half the industry got into like bartending and waiting tables, right? And so it's like, well, you got to find something to do. So he knew what I was capable of, which was, which was great. He knew what I was coming from, knew what I wanted to do. And not to say this is the right decision, ultimately it ended up being the wrong decision, but it certainly worked well for the time that we were together. Um, when I hired him on, I hired him on as my operations manager. And during that time, I, it was a percentage base. So I paid him, at the time I didn't realize how fast this was gonna ramp up, but I was paying him 25% of the gross. So everything I made, he was getting paid 25%. Now there's no salary involved, but he was getting paid a percentage of what it was that, uh, that we made. So that was the start. Now I'm grateful for it because he was the personality type that understood systems and was the tech guy. That's just not me. And uh, so he did a great job at implementing. And I, I, you know, I couldn't be where I am today without putting those implementations into place with the systems and everything else, building out the CRMs and so on and so forth. But we started that way and it was, it was strong. Him and I were a good team. I got to a point where I was not, uh, I, basically I got to a point of ratification and I would hand it off. And he would take it, you know, the rest of the way. It allowed me to continue to be able to work with more clients and be spend more face time with them, right? So from there, we built other systems, which is extremely important. People say, Nathan, how do you build teams? I said, what you got to do is you got to build the systems first. You have no business building any type of team unless you have a system. Said, but you got to hire the right people if you yourself aren't going to build that system. Because really, you got two priorities, Josh. You got one is to be able to work in your business and work on your business. The challenge is if you're constantly working in your business, you're constantly in the trench trenches. You never have an opportunity to work on your business and grow your business. So having somebody else to do that is critical. So I, so I had him on. He, he did that. He built out the systems, was you know, taking everything and doing all the processing for all of our cases. And then we started catching some steam with that. At that point, we were ready to hire on a buyer's agent. Now, of course, before in my story, I mentioned that I hired a buyer's agent in the past. It didn't work out well. Well, the reason why it didn't work out well is because that's my responsibility. I wasn't a very good leader. I was not a good trainer. I was not training. Our responsibility as a leader is to train, right? It's to give them the tools and services necessary to be successful in this business. If we can't provide that, we have no business being a leader at all. I recognized that over that period of time. One, it was an expensive lesson, but two, I knew that was my responsibility. So we took on a buyer's agent that came on. He, he had, a, you know, he was doing decent. Obviously, he was running through the 2004, five, and six time frame where everybody was doing decent. His best year in real estate was six transactions. He's still with me today. I took him from six transactions. Last year, he did 27 transactions. I mean, he's, he's been phenomenal. He's an asset to our team. So we hired him on. We started catching more steam, which has been good. We started getting into more lead gen during that time. We started buying into Zillow ads, and that was in 2008. And then we started taking on another guy. What we found is that we started picking up even more steam, going into more past clients and referrals, which is great. We do a lot of team events, a lot of events for that of our past clients and referrals as well. And then so we we're having a lot more touch points with that of our past clients, even more so that I could deal with myself personally. And the gentleman that I hired as my operations manager, he was the systems guy. He was the tech guy, right? And he was the operations guy. He's not your touchy-feely guy. He was not the one that was going to make your clients feel good at all, right? I mean, he was going to get the job done, which is important, 
but he's not the one that's going to sit down and have a conversation with you. So I knew at that time it's time to hire that client care coordinator. So we did. We hired our first client care coordinator. She was phenomenal. Clients, you know, they were like, yeah, great. We can talk to Nathan, but we'd much rather talk to her. So <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. She was in charge of putting our events together, doing a lot of our social media stuff. And, uh, you know, just, just being that, that front person, is, you know, making us look good, right? When the phone rang, she was there, and she, she facilitated all that. That was wonderful. And then from there, we really started to grow, adding on more and more people. Through that, we knew we had to continue to build out the system, grow the system, continue our lead gen, right? So we could produce leads for the people that were coming on and continue to grow from there. Now, as this continued to grow, you know, we went through a couple of different client care. Fortunately, I was very lucky. A lot of the client care um, people that ever worked for me, they start to actually sell real estate with me as well. Either they started to sell real estate with me or they went out and started their own company, which both I'm just as proud for, right? But I'm still very close with all of them. But through this process, we grew and we grew rapidly. So much so at the end of the year, uh, it was two years ago, I had that operations manager. I was looking at his uh, final bill uh, for the year because once again, he's paying 25%. And the last year he worked with me, he made $245,000 his last year working for me. Now, for the team leaders that are on this call, to have an operations manager that's making $245,000 a year uh, is a little excessive. So uh, I, at that point, the culture of the team was also being sacrificed um, because it was just not going in the right direction. I was spending a lot of time on the road during that time. I was, I was coaching. I was training. I was speaking in a lot of different places. And um, I wasn't here. And something else that I recognized during this expensive lesson is that our responsibility as a leader, uh, or for me, I, I'm a husband and father of, of two, and for me, I read a big fan of Brian Tracy. And Brian Tracy taught me a long time ago is that your kids will determine how much you love them by not what you give them, but how much time you provide to them. Well, it's no different than us being team leaders. Our responsibility as a team leader is to provide face time to that of the people that we serve, right? If we're not providing the face time, we just say, yeah, we're, we're giving you leads, these aren't enough. That's not why they're on part of our team. They're part of our team because of our culture. They're part of our team because of what we train and educate them. We're part of our team because we show them there's an opportunity to grow. If we can't provide that, they're not going to be a part of our team. They're going to be a part of somebody else's team. Right? Everybody says they got leads. It's what's behind the leads is so important. So when I was traveling, I, I wasn't providing enough of my FaceTime. I wasn't providing the training. Yeah, we had the support, but the culture was being sacrificed. They weren't getting the training they deserved. And then during that time, unfortunately, things started to fall apart. I saw that. And I said, we got to change this thing up. So unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, I imploded the team. I let go of about four different agents, let go of a lot of the operations staff, and I started fresh. And I, during that time, I spent a lot of time digging in deep on what we've all read, the good to greats, right? The entrepreneurial roller coaster, digging in deep and using those as my manuals to say, how can I build this thing out? Truly what resonated more than anything else was hiring based on who they are, not what they're capable of. Hiring based on who you could train them to do just about anything. As long as they're the right people, the most important, the right people for your culture. So I wanted to create a high energy, right? A, a team made up of integrity, honesty, loyalty, people that really care for the people that they served. That's why I want to build out this team. I got so very lucky that when I started building this team back up again, the way I built it out is I hired that operations manager again. But this time I hired two operations managers. Of course, I had the budget after what I saw. So I hired two operations managers. As I said, Josh, you do two, one of two things, right? You're working either in your business or on your business. Both need to occur, obviously, to continue to grow. So that's what I hired those two operations managers for. One to work in the business. He was in charge of all the processing of all the cases within the entire team. Overall, basically managing that of the team. So we've got seven agents on our team, and he was responsible for the processing of all of those transactions, right? And also being the liaison between them and myself, and just be there to oversee a lot of the transactions. Then we hired a guy to work on the business, the growth of the business. Talk about the lead gen. Talk about the conversion of those leads. Set up the different websites. Yeah, the conversions, the boom towns. Setting all that kind of stuff was his responsibility. Really understanding where those conversions were and where the greatest return of those investments were coming from. Right? That was his responsibility. He also was responsible for the recruiting. Because during that time, we also went on a major recruiting uh, push with hiring on new agents, but also hiring more staff as well. We hired another client care coordinator because my other client care, she transitioned to be an agent, which was awesome. We took on another client care coordinator where her job is in charge of the processing. It's in charge of the processing and working underneath Mike, my other operations manager. Then we grew into a point where our events, we do major, major events throughout the year. We do two major events and now I'm doing smaller events as well. But our events, a spring event could be something. So a beer and wine tasting and we get 275 adults at a, uh, a mansion in the area. And we do pasture d'oeuvres and we do 17 different types of Italian wines or 
eight different types of beers. It's a really high end event. My wife posts it. It's it's basically like a small wedding. She's she's uh, unfortunately she's expensive, um, but she's good. She's really good. Uh, we do that in the spring. In the fall, we do a big Butler's Orchard event, which is a Butler's Orchard is a is an orchard out in our area, and we get over 400 people at one of these events. We get a live, uh, we get a Nashville recording artist. We get them to come up. He just does acoustic. It's awesome. Uh, we do uh, food. We do, it's just casual. So it's keg beer and wine. It's bonfires. It's hay rides. It's all kinds of stuff like that. So we continue having these crazy events, which 70% of my business comes from my past clients' referrals. So it has to be done this way because we want to offer experiences to that of the people that obviously support us. So we hired Kyle. She's our marketing director. She handles all of our events, all of our marketing, all of our social media. She creates the face of what Dart Homes is as a team, and she's phenomenal, but I can get her to focus on that. In addition to that, we also hired an ISA, and his job, obviously, for the people on this call, most of the people understand that. His job is to scrub and cultivate the leads, because just like you know, we were talking about before, it's the Zillows, it's the Trulias, it's the Boomtowns, it's all the other sources that are out there. He's out there scrubbing them, qualifying them before they're distributed to that of the agents. So that's how we're built out. But Josh, a big part of what it is I do, it comes down to that leadership role. Because the reality is, not everybody was made to be a leader. I know before the call started, we talked about you know, the transitions and, and the phase that people have to go through, through their growth phase. Well, I was at a talk uh, two weeks ago in Indiana, and we were talking about leadership and, and growing and building a team. And I said, well, think about it this way, guys. Back when you guys all started your real estate career, we all said, yeah, we want to sell real estate because of why. Oh, we're going to start real estate so we have free time. We're going to start real estate so we can make all kinds of money. We don't have to work from nine to five. And how did all that work out? Well, we all know what that is. It's bullshit. Yeah, this is not a nine to five job. Real estate is a lifestyle. You better embrace it. You better love it or you got to get out of it, right? It's Monday through Friday. It's Saturday and Sunday, right? This is something we embrace. And if you're free time, if you're starting real estate looking for free time, you can forget about it because your free time needs to be applied towards prospecting. If you're not doing that, you're out of the business. Right then, the first five years we started to get you get you know get some momentum going. We're feeling good. Maybe it's seven. Maybe it's ten years. We're in the business. We said, "All right, good. I'm successful right now. I've got a great business. I'm generating leads on a consistent basis. Now it's time for me to build a team. I'm going to build a team. Why? I'm going to build a team so I get more free time. Bullshit. Because if we're not using that free time with training and educating our people, they're going to go find somebody else that's going to take care of that for them. Right? So. That's the key. So for me, my responsibility is to train and educate my people. If I don't, somebody else will. That's my responsibility. It's not only to train and educate them, but because I know how big my responsibility is, i got to show them that there's an opportunity for growth. Because I'm not only responsible for Micah and my team, but I'm responsible for Val, his wife. I'm, in, I'm responsible for Victoria, for Alexandria, his two kids. I'm, I'm responsible for Daniel and his two kids. I'm just responsible for Marcy and her two kids. Right? That's my responsibility as a team leader. And that's what a lot of people don't think about when they just start determining that they're going to want to build a team. They're thinking, no, no, if I just provide them enough leads, I'm going to get conversion based on this and that and the other, and I'm going to be net and this. No, that's not what it is. We've got to apply training. So not only are they trained by me, my team has spent you know, training them personally, but then I also hired professional coaches for them as well, outside of me. Because us as team leaders, we're almost too close. They're like, oh, of course Nathan says that. Well, sometimes I need to hear from other people as well. So training has been a big part of that. Critical. Yeah, dude. So, <clears throat> and I couldn't agree with, with more with everything that you said there, man. It's, and that's why you're such a successful team leader is, man, I mean, you can tell it with your passion and you're in it for the right reasons. Okay, but dude, today, I mean, you're, you're a broker owner. Mm -hmm. You're a team leader running a team of 12. But you're personally out there selling. <clears throat> you know, last year your team did about 60-some million, which you did about half of that personally. So you've yeah. got to be like laser focused. Your, your, your schedule has to be spot on. Like, walk us through kind of how you do it. I mean, what's a typical day look like for you, dude? Yeah, no, it's a great question. For me, yeah, it's all about mindset. Uh, for me, it's as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's how I book in my day. It's how I start it, how I ended it. so critical. Uh, I know that I have to have the right mindset. If I'm not going in the right mindset, I'm toast for the rest of the day. So for me personally, I wake up early. First thing in the morning, I'm waking up. I'm going downstairs, going to my home office. And during that time, I spend a lot of time in my R&R &R time. During my R&R time, I'm journaling, I'm reading something, I'm, I'm reviewing my goals, looking at my future focus, something that's critical for me. Because like, like I said, back in 2007, 2008, when I was going through that slump, that's the only thing that pulled me out of it, is because I had to change my mindset. I had to turn off the news, right? I had to know that I was responsible for what I was putting into myself. From that, I spent the first, ten, the first hour doing that, I'm waking up at 6, going downstairs, getting my day started there, and from there, I go to the gym. I know that I have to go to the gym to, to just to let myself go, because otherwise... 
it, this is a high this is a high stress job, right? I mean, we got to keep it high energy. So for me, I go to the gym, and then from that, I go home, have breakfast with the kids, and then drive them to school and get in the office. For me, and as I teach the team, is I look at and I actually learned this from uh, Darren Hardy. Now, he's the editor of Success Magazine. He wrote two phenomenal books: The Entrepreneur Roller Coaster, a Compound Effect. He taught us something called jam sessions, and he, he breaks down. He says you got to break your day down into jam sessions. It could be however long you want them to be, but you got to know these are isolated periods of time that you're focused on just that one thing during that time. For me, I create 90-minute jam sessions. My first way to start the morning is a 90-minute jam session, uninterrupted. My wife knows I'm waking up early so that I don't have any interruptions. I got a six and a three-year-old. <laughs> There's plenty of opportunity for interruptions, but if I wake up early enough, they're not coming downstairs. So that's my first start of that jam session. Then I get in the office, and the first 90 minutes that I'm here, it's total jam session, right? So what I know is when I get in the office about 9, 15, 9, 30 in the morning, it's just outgoing phone calls. I want to be in a position where I can always be responsive and never reactive, right? So how do I do that? One, my staff, my wife, nobody has ever heard my cell phone ring. reason why is because I keep it on silent. I never want to be caught in a situation where I'm going to be reactive because if I'm reactive, I'm not prepared. So during those jam sessions, I'm making outgoing phone calls. I run everything on a CRM. I use something called Property Base. It's a, it's a, it's a platform off of uh, Salesforce. It outlines exactly who I have to call during the day. Who am I calling? Well, obviously, I'm doing lead follow-up. I'm doing prospecting. I'm also calling past clients. Most of my day is made up with the lead follow-up and that of the past clients, right? Because that's the bulk of my business is coming from. But that's my 90 minutes. The first 90 minutes is making those outgoing phone calls. My door is shut. My blinds are pulled. Everybody knows what I'm doing, and I expect everybody else in my office to be doing the same thing. It's actually kind of funny because my operations manager, he throws in a little Bob Marley as soon as I walk down the hall because he, it's jam time. So we'd be jamming. That's, that's what we're doing back here in the office. So, but it makes it fun. They know what I'm doing. Uh, so the first 90 minutes, I'm making those outgoing calls. I'm booking my appointments. Right? I know exactly how many appointments I need to book on a weekly basis to ensure the amount of money that I want to make for that particular goal and that for, that, for that year. But then, uh, you know, the, the second half of the day, that's all focused on the training. I'm spending my time spending with the agents, doing whether it be coaching sessions or training or one-on-ones or whatever. Uh, we're working with that. And then the evenings are set up for the listing appointments. For me, I take my listing appointments at 3 o'clock and or 5 o'clock. I have three priorities and my top three that I'm focused on. My top three is generating leads on a regular and consistent basis for that of my team. Second is motivating and inspiring my team. I got to do that. Uh, if I'm not doing that, then then I'm just like everybody else that's out there. And then three right now is those listening appointments. It's critical. So those are my top three and really how I how I focus on my day. Yeah, so you talked a lot about self-development, man, and, and all leaders are readers, right? Jim Rohn yeah. quote out there. So um, what are some of the most profound books? I know it's so tough because there's so many great books, but what do you what are some of the top ones that you feel that have really shaped you as an entrepreneur? Yeah, yeah. Well, it started with Brian Tracy. Uh, the uh, uh, psychology of achievement is uh, well. You get a kick out of this. Is that it, that tape cassette that came out in the early, I guess, late eighties, early nineties? Something my dad bought, and uh, so he gave it to me when I was wrapping up college, and I loved it. I listened to those cassette tapes all the time, just until my car didn't have a cassette player anymore. <laughs> then, I, then I figured that someone else out. But then they came out with that guy. They came out with the CD, so it all worked out just well. But uh, Brian Tracy has been a huge, uh, you know, a huge person for me. Uh, my coach, Richard Robbins, uh, he's got uh, his training program, and actually that's something I use on a regular basis that, uh, that I, I find a huge, to be a huge resource for not only my office, but also for the agents on my team. He's got this on-demand training program, which is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we've been beta testing this thing for the last six months. He's rolled it out in the last month and a half for other people, but what it does, it's a training online online interactive training program for you know for individual agents for teams for brokers to be able to use to help with the training it's been a huge asset for me and, and certainly the agents on my team so that's been huge but as far as books he wrote a book called deliver the unexpected really pushing it to the next level for how to deliver the unexpected for that of your clients your sphere excuse the sirens out there um, and you know that's a good one entrepreneur roller coaster is one of my favorites um, Oh, there's, a, there's another one, uh, Essentialism. I just got done reading that one about six months ago. That, that's been uh, impactful in my life. And reading one right now, which uh, is, is funny, it's uh, Miracle Morning, uh, is, is a book that I'm halfway through now. And, and uh, I'm thinking to myself, man, did, how, how did you find out what I do every morning? But uh, it, it, it's, good, it's good stuff. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff. And, you know, you try to take something uh, out of everything you read. 
Um, I'm part of a, a, mastermind, a, a mastermind group that we network and, and we read every, every month. We always have a book to read. And, you know, we've got a lot of good ones that we try to pull something out of. But I would say those are my top three. Yeah, so what keeps you, man, um, and you experienced this once before, which you walked us through your journey, but we find that good can be the worst enemy to greatness. It's so easy to get complacent, have it where things are good enough. I mean, you're at a point right now where you're making a lot of money. You could just get to the point of being good enough, right? Just start getting complacent again. What keeps you every single day leveling up, man, going for that, that greatness and making sure that you're growing? Well, it's the passion, Josh. I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. And, and people say, Nathan, where do you find your passion? And, and you say, I've, I've lost my passion. Bullshit. You don't lose your passion, right? You just got to re-engage your passion. But you got to figure out what you're passionate about. For me, I'm passionate about growth. Like, if I'm not growing, I'm dying. I mean, I, everybody's heard that analogy, but, like, I, I know this. Like, if I'm not growing something, it, it's a problem for me. So for me, I want to focus on my growth, okay? But what am I passionate about? When I'm passionate about something is I have to identify, one, for most importantly, what is it that I do? Who do I do it for and why do I do it? What do I do? I want to help people. I truly want to help people. That's what I want to do. I want to do it with high energy. I want to do it with, you know, I want to be with integrity, with honesty. I really want to help people. Who do I do it for? Well, I want to do it for the, the greater good of not only my industry, but also for the people that I serve, whether it be my buyers and or my sellers, right? But my why is really the most important thing. Why do I do what I do? Why do I want to continue to grow? Because one is I want to, I want to make a contribution. I want to make a contribution to the, that of the marketplace that I serve which is so very important. But more importantly is I want to leave a legacy and I want to show that you know, hard work does pay off for that of my kids and for my wife. And we, we make significant sacrifices with as hard as we work, right? But we got to do it for something, right? So for that, why do I do it? I do it for my wife, Danielle. I do it for my son, Landon. And I do it for my daughter, Gabriella. That's why I do what I do, right? And as long as I know what my why is, and that's, you know, everybody says, well, how do you identify your why? It's not easy to find your why. I mean, I'm not trying to say that it's easy. But for me, as much as I struggled with trying to identify my why, I just had to look back at what was at my house. Right. My why is for my family, right? That's why I do what I do. That's why I work as hard as I do. I want to build a legacy for something that my family can be proud of and something that they can then take to a different level, just like what my dad did. So, you know, you've got a young family, dude, right? Yeah. And, and so many entrepreneurs, um, and we've seen this in so many people, they work, 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 grind, grind, grind. Next thing they know, they don't know their kids, they're divorced, they don't know their wife. I mean, we have to work a, a bazillion hours in this industry. I don't really believe in the word balance, but how do, you, how do you make sure that you're not neglecting those relationships that are critical for you as well? Yeah, I, I can't say that I'm a master at that. It, it's something that I obviously constantly struggle with, just like all of us do. But I'm, I'm aware of it, which I think is it gives me a bit of an edge, an advantage there, because I am aware of it. Yeah, and there's no such thing as balance. I mean, come on. You, if, you're, if you're excelling in one area, you're sacrificing something else, right? I mean, it, it's, it's just the natural flow of how things go. But you need, you need to have balance, right? And, and how I try to balance is taking that time off. Now, a lot of times in, in our industry or entrepreneurs as a whole, people look at time off as an opportunity to be able to take a step back and then work on their business, right? They want to just talk about work, 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 work when they're on vacation. Stop that. For me, I had to stop that because my, you know, that's that time that I'm taking off, that I just that is owed to my family. That is owed to my wife. It's owed to my kids because that's what I work so hard for. So I can provide these experiences for my kids. And if I can't participate in those experiences, what's the point? Right? So yeah, balance is extremely difficult. For me, honestly, I have to step away. I, I have to get out of town. I can't do it at home. Like my wife's like, why don't we just stay home for the weekend? I can't just stay home for the weekend. I mean, like I can, but I'm not ever detached from everything that I got going on. So um, for me, just getting out and, and, and really being uh, with my family when I'm with them is, is so critical. But balance is a constant struggle. And uh, for the ones that master that, hey, my hat's off to you. But uh, I don't know. You're, you're, there might be something else you're sacrificing during that. I don't know. This is my opinion. <laughs> yep. Absolutely, man. Love it. So a few last questions for you, man. But before we jump into these, you know, somebody, maybe they're in your area and wants to join your team or your brokerage or just has questions and, and wants to reach out to you. What's the best place for our listeners to learn more about you and then uh, reach out to you? Sure, sure. Well, you can find me on my website. It's just www.darthomes.com. That's my website. I got a YouTube channel at darthomes.tv. So you can see a lot of day in the life videos that we host to talk about our talk about our team or that of even testimonies and working with that of our past clients and what have you. Uh, or you just give me a call. You, you, could, you could find me on Facebook. I'm not a tough guy to find. If I was, and my prospecting is all for nothing. But, uh, but no, I'm an easy guy to find. Uh, you can even call me on my cell. All that stuff available to you on the, on the web there. Awesome, man. Awesome. So 
let's say something happens, you know, and I know this has happened in the past, so it might be a pretty easy question for you to answer, but something happens and you financially get wiped out again. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, your, your, your health's good, family's good, all that's good, but your business is wiped out. Um, but you've retained all the knowledge that you've retained over all these years of entrepreneurship and doing this. But you have, let's say, like 300 bucks left in your bank account. Yep. What are the first few things you immediately go out there and do really to rebuild this massive business that you built? That's a great question. It's something that I'm, I'm aware of, right? You have to be aware of that. Worst, first and foremost, it's mindset. You got to get yourself in the right mindset because if you have the wrong mindset, you're never going to accomplish anything. So you have to get yourself in the right, 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 right mindset. How do I do that? Like I said, it's how I book in my day. It's how I start it. It's how I finish it. If I don't start my morning the right way, I look at it just like you know the, the miracle morning says. It's the rudder of your day, right? So I want to establish that. Once I have the right mindset, then I can go out and accomplish just about anything. After mindset, honestly, Josh, it's straight grit. I mean, it's just hard work. It's determination. It's saying, you know what? I'm going to get knocked down. I'm going to get back up, and I'm going to just bust through the, these walls. And that's just straight grit and hard work, right? So with a combination of the mindset, the willingness to go out there and just hustle and work hard, you're going to be just fine. From that, then it comes to finesse, right? When you start to build and grow, then you can start to finesse a little bit where you're not the one hustling and doing the straight grit and, and, and pounding constantly. But you do have to transition yourself. You have to become somebody different while you're transitioning through these you know, different periods of your life. Because if you don't become somebody different, do what it is they do, you're never going to grow to the levels that you anticipate growing to, right? So, yeah. But it comes down to mindset, and then, of course, it's all straight hard work. Where, uh, where do you see yourself taking this, man? Because you've you got a lot of things going on. Your team's growing. Your brokerage is growing. You know, do, do you find yourself kind of going down one more path more so than the other? Where do you, where, I know it's a tough question, but where do, you see your, where do you see yourself going with all this? Yeah, no, I mean, growth is always what I'm focused on, right? So where is it? Where's the next step? Josh, I really like making a contribution to this industry, and I do want to make a unique contribution to the marketplace that I serve. I, I like to do that, and I strive to do that for the experiences of my clients, uh, which I am grateful for, and I, I know that I have something to work hard and strive for all the time. I'm very fortunate, though, that 70% of our business comes from that of our past clients' referrals. I'm so grateful for that. I love being able to host these events and, and knowing that I made an impact in these people's lives and that they refer us out, and they're our advocates. Like To me, that's huge. But then it's also when I have an opportunity to be able to coach or to be able to train or speak another, you know, speak to an agent or entrepreneur in our marketplace. Like that, to me, is fulfilling. I, I like to be able to show them that there is opportunities to grow, show them kind of how that roadmap works and looks like and what they have to do to put things together so they can continue to grow and truly build a life that, you know, build a business that supports the life that they want to live, right? It's, it's so very important. People say it all the time, but it's another thing to actually do it. You know, when I speak or I'm training or I'm coaching, you, you, there's cur- certain objections, uh, objectives that you have. One is you want to make them think differently. You want to make them feel differently. But most importantly, Josh, you want to make them act differently. And putting something in, a, in an emotion to get them to act differently is so difficult. But to me, that, that's just a challenge that I look forward to, to taking on, right? So, uh, honestly, is there bigger things? Is there other things I want to do? Absolutely. If there wasn't, then I'd be bored out of my mind. It's, 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 all, it's all predicated on growth, and, and, and we're going to continue to grow things. But I want to do with making an impact, but a, a positive and significant impact in the marketplace. No question. Love it, dude. Love it, man. And, and, and yeah, you got... I, don't, I hate the word gifts because you, you, they're not gifts. They're, they're characteristics that you've earned over the years. But, I mean, dude, you're, you're an amazing entrepreneur, obviously very amazing at your craft, very mo- you know, motivational dude. So you know, I, I definitely see a, a, a big mentorship coaching program in your future at some point, man. So, <laughs> um, you know, with, with, this, with this podcast, man, I created this podcast about a year ago just because huh? I got so sick and tired of, of all the information that's available out there. Um, by people that are operating from a place of theory. It seems like a, even the most, you know, the top coaches in our industry have never actually went out there and done it. So I'm like, well, instead of bitching about it, let me just go out there and create a platform where we interview the doers, guys like yourself that have created these epic businesses and just pick your brains and, and, and offer it a free platform for others to go out there and, and be able to create their own epic businesses. Dude. So with that being said, man, do you have any last words of motivation or inspiration that you'd like to leave our listener base with so they can go out there and create that amazing business and life that they know that they truly want and deserve? Yeah, yeah. I mean, guys, it comes down to passion. I mean, you, you, you got to find your passion. you got to understand what is it you want to work so hard for. Uh, once you can identify what your passion is, you need to write it down. You need to write it down in a journal. You need to figure out how you can build up those goals. But what is it you're going to have to do in order to make sure that you actually can follow through with whatever that passion is? But this passion is more than just goals. People write down goals all the time. I mean, we just clear the first of the year, right? I mean, you may have done your business plan in October, November to get you set forward for what you're going to do in 2016. 
So if you look at your goals, you most like most people probably just put a number. You put a number out there, say, I want to make, I don't know, 500000 this year, whatever it may be. But the question I would have for you is that if you made $500,000 here in 2016, per se, if it's just 500000 how is that $500,000 going to change your life? Maybe last year you made three fifty. This year it's going to be five hundred. How is that one hundred and fifty dollars difference going to change your life, change your family's life? Is it or is it not? If it's not, and it's not going to say it's not going to buy you that second home, it's not going to get your kids through private school, it's not going to do whatever it might do, and it's not something that has a burning desire that's created in your gut, then you have to ask yourself that question: Is this a worthy goal? Right? Is this really going to push and drive me passionately enough to continue to move things forward? That's the question you have to ask yourself. So in order to do that, though, you have to understand that it's all about mindset. You have to be able to look at that on a daily basis, get that burning desire you every morning you wake up to push yourself through the day. Because that's going to make you, one, think differently, feel differently, but act differently. Because without the passion, without that, that, that burning desire that you carry in yourself, none of that's even worth it. But the fun part about this, Josh, is as we continue to progress through our lives, we're always going to be progressing in a different level. Now, am I the same person that started my first year in real estate in 2002 as just a kid that couldn't hold down a girlfriend, was hustling you know, 16 hours a day, living in his parents' house, driving my dad's old Cadillac showing houses? No, I'm not the same guy. Because every transition I made in my life, Josh, I had to become somebody different. I learned a long time ago that most people are working against the natural progression of life. Most people can make a ton of excuses in their life to say why it is they don't have what they want to have. Most people can say, well, you know, I, I want to be that guy that makes or $500,000, but I can't do that because I don't drive the right car. I don't live in the right area. I don't have the right team. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. What the reality is, and the natural progression that most people need to live their life is, they have to understand that, you know what, they have to become somebody different. Me, at a, a, a new agent or somebody that's making 100000 or somebody that was struggling in 2007, I'm not the same person I am in 2016. I had to become somebody different. I had to figure out what is it those people do on an annual, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily basis. I had to do what they do in order to have what it is I wanted to have, right? So understanding that, but that's a lot of self-reflection. That's all mindset, right? So you got to get yourself in the right mindset. You got to journal. To me, I'm a big journaler. When somebody first told me about journaling, I'm like, I don't know, that seems hokey. I'm not, I'm not buying into that crap. But you know, when it started working, <laughs> I'm not going to argue it anymore. So you got to get yourself right in the mindset, but it's all about passion. And if you're not passionate about the direction you're going in, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. That in of itself is complacency. So that's kind of where I like to leave you at. <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. Powerful words. And our listener base, I know we end every podcast with this, you guys, but information is not power, right? Information without implementation is really just the start to delusion. So you guys just heard from one of the top uh, real estate agents on the planet, you know, shared a lot of just amazing, amazing nuggets with you guys today. Take something that you learn, implement it into your life, implement your business, which will then create power for you guys. Um, so go out there, create that life that you know you want and deserve. And, and Nate, dude, this has been, uh, it's been awesome, man. You got me hella fired up and uh, I know you got the <laughs> listeners fired up, dude. So appreciate you taking time on your busy day to be here, man. It's truly an honor, brother. My pleasure, Josh. And thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. All right, guys. We will see you next time.